this morning. Amen. In the transition, they've had to spend a lot of time, uh, extra time, uh, trying to make it all work. And I think God is blessing that. Amen. Amen. And I appreciate every hour they spend, every moment, uh, their talents, using them for the glory of God. We all have talents. We all have abilities. And God wants us to use those things because one day we're going to give account of those things. We have time, talent, treasure, and truth that God wants us to share with those around us. And so I hope today that you're making the most of that because Jesus is coming back. How many of you know Jesus is coming back? Are you ready? That's the next question. Are you ready? All right. Turning your Bibles this morning to Ezekiel chapter 16. I'll be reading verse 1 through 4. 14, I'm sorry. Ezekiel 16, verse 1 through 14. I'll be reading from the New King James Version. And I know you just sat down, but hey, if you will, in honor of God's Word, if you can, uh, let's stand as I read these 14 verses. Ezekiel, Old Testament. Ezekiel chapter 16, verse 1 through 14. It says, Again the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, cause Jerusalem to know her abominations. And say, Thus saith the Lord God to Jerusalem, Your birth and your nativity are from the land of Canaan. Your father was an Amorite and your mother a Hittite. As for your nativity, on the day you were born, your navel cord was not cut, nor were you washed in water to cleanse you. You were not rubbed with salt, nor wrapped in swaddling clothes. No, I pity you pitied you to do any of those things for you to have compassion on you but you were thrown out into the open field when you were loathed on the day you were born and when I passed by you and saw you struggling in your blood I said to you in your blood live yes I said to you in your blood live I made you thrive like a plant in the field and you grew matured and became very beautiful your breasts were formed, your hair grew, but you were naked and bare. When I passed by you again and looked upon you, indeed, your time was the time of love. So I spread my wing over you and covered your nakedness. Yes, I swore an oath to you and entered into a covenant with you, and you became mine, says the Lord God. Then I washed you in water. Yes, I thoroughly washed off your blood, and I anointed you with oil. I clothed you in embroidered cloth and gave you sandals of badger skin. I clothed you with fine linen and covered you with silk. I adorned you with ornaments, put bracelets on your wrist and a chain on your neck. And I put a jewel in your nose, earrings in your ears, and a beautiful crown on your head. Thus you were adorned with gold and silver, and your clothing was of fine linen, silk, and embroidered cloth. You ate pastry of fine flour, honey, and oil. You were exceedingly beautiful and succeeded to royalty. Your fame went out among the nations because of your beauty, for it was perfect through my splendor which I bestowed upon you, says the Lord God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I pray today that, Lord, that you would open our hearts. Lord, unlock the doors on those secret places. And Lord, I pray that You would move beyond the walls that we sometimes create. Walls of religion. Lord, walls of hurt and pain. Questions and doubts. Lord, we've all had them. And Lord, these things can become barriers to hearing Your truth. And they can become tools in the hand of the devil. To keep us from knowing the truth. For you said, if you abide in my word and my word abides in you, then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. I pray, Lord, that today that we will be set free by the truth. And Lord, I pray that today you'll give us eyes to see, ears to hear, and a heart to understand. Father, we're not coming for a religious service. Although there is religious activity that takes place, we're coming to meet with you, the true and the living God. 
We're coming to honor the one who died for us, Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. We come to do your will, O God. We come to be the church that you want us to be. And Lord, we can't do that in our own strength or power. So we invite the help of your Holy Spirit to speak to our hearts and change our lives. Lord, let us not leave the same as when we came. I pray this all in Jesus' name and everybody said, Amen. God bless you. You may be seated. The title of the message today is The Tale of the Bride. The Tale of the Bride. How many of you ever watched the old Disney classic Cinderella? I grew up watching Cinderella. It was a neat story. How someone that was just so mistreated, kind of tr mistreated by the old wicked stepmother and her daughters, and she was forced to live a life of slavery, and she was belittled, she was loathed, she was not cared for. But in the end, there was a prince. In the end, there was someone that noticed her. And there, that someone who noticed her was the prince of the whole kingdom and chose her to be his bride. Out of all of the others that he could have chosen, he chose one that was loathed and despised. Well, I remember watching that movie. There's been lots of other variations, not just animation, but those that are dramatized and put on the screen. But many of you may not know that this story of Cinderella, although it wasn't her name, has had many variants in, throughout history. The oldest is between 7 B.C. and 23 A.D., and it's the story of a Greek girl who marries the king of Egypt. A Greek girl who marries the king of Egypt. So this story, this romance, this idea that God could take someone that's of lowly stature and make them into a queen is a wonderful story and it brings hope to our lives. In fact, it's a message for us today because in reality, we are like Cinderella. In reality, we are those nobodies. In reality, we have felt like we were pushed aside and unnoticed Maybe you feel like you've been abused. Maybe you feel like you've gone through trials that you didn't deserve as Cinderella did. But understand this today, that there is a God in heaven who loves you. Amen? And so in this passage, and I encourage you to read all of Ezekiel 16, because it's not just a story of, of blessing and romance as the first verses there, but it's also a story of how people... And Jerusalem became unfaithful to God. They became unfaithful to God. And we've all been there too. We've all been down that path. And so we're going to look at that today. First of all, the origin of the bride. The origin of the bride. Jerusalem was the bride. Jerusalem is a city in Israel. Jerusalem is the capital of modern Israel. Jerusalem is a place that is all brewing in contention. Many groups are trying to get Jerusalem as their own. Of all the cities in the world, there is a struggle for Jerusalem. I believe because Jerusalem is God's city. Jerusalem is the heartbeat of Jesus and so we see the story of Jerusalem, and, and it is a Cinderella story. But it didn't start out as a wonderful city. In fact, he said it was a pagan city. Jerusalem was there by another name, long before it became the capital under David. It was a pagan city. It was in the land of Canaan. Canaan was a place of pagan worshipers. In fact, it says your father was an Amorite and your mother a Hittite. These were the people of the land who began that city. So Jerusalem did not have a religious beginning in the sense of with God. 
It was a pagan center. Jerusalem, originally Salim or Salem, was a place of depression. Many of you uh, have heard, if you've read the Bible, read it, and know of the god Molech or Milcom. Jerusalem was a place of child sacrifice unto Molech. See, in those days, they believed that to gain some mercy from Molech, they had to give their own newborn babies as sacrifices to appease his anger and gain his favor. Jerusalem was one of those places. It would have been a place of great grief for a mother who had just given birth to her baby, but thought that somehow you had to appease this god, Milcom or Molech. Molech was the god of the Ammonites. And so this was a despised place. And so in this place, you can see the story of a little baby that is being cast away, cast aside. And, you know, that seems to be a tragedy for any, to anyone. But for those who are seeking children, love children especially, and praying for a baby, the idea that anyone could throw away a baby is just unimaginable. And yet it happens today. It happens today. In fact, that same spirit, I believe, is behind abortion today. I believe that same spirit trying to destroy life from the womb. God is the giver of life. And God cares. And then even after they're born, many times they're put in a dumpster or a trash can or left somewhere just to die. In the cities, they call them dumpster babies. And maybe if they survive, if they cry out and someone hears them crying, maybe the mother's on drugs and she just doesn't think she can take care of her baby. Maybe the woman is a prostitute. Whatever it is. But babies that are thrown away. Well, Jerusalem was like that rejected newborn baby. He gives a description here. It says she was cast away at birth. There was no one there to cut the navel cord. I mean, this is just raw from birth. No one to cut the navel cord. No one to wash off the baby. To rub her with salt, which was a practice in that day to take care of the skin of the baby. Or to put clothes on her. These swaddling cloths to wrap there. It says no one pitied her. No one had compassion on her. It's a sad story to think that this newborn baby could be set aside with no one to love her. No one to care. No one that would have compassion on her. And it says she was abhorred from birth. She wasn't wanted. And she was thrown out into the open field, obviously to die. That was Jerusalem. That was this city that God is talking about. Thrown out to die. Just trash. Rubbish. You know, in our life, that's how the devil looks at us. We're just trash. That's how the world may see us. We're just rubbish and trash. Maybe you grew up in a home where people didn't care about you. You were just an inconvenience in the home. Maybe you've heard words like, I should have aborted you. I almost did. Now I wish I had. To grow up hearing words like, you'll never amount to anything. You'll never make anything out of your life. You're just going to be a dropout. You're just going to be a throwaway of society. Well, that's what Jerusalem was. And Jerusalem reminds us of our own lost condition apart from Christ. That's how we are without Jesus. We're just thrown out to the world. Nobody cares. Nobody cared whether we would go to heaven or not. Nobody cared whether we would have eternal life or not. But God 
just like he did with Jerusalem, shows mercy. It says here that he passed by her. You know, there comes a time in our life where we have an encounter with God. We have an encounter with God because God is a God of encounters. I'm not talking about just being religious and going to church. You can have your name on a church roll. You can be a member of a certain denomination. I grew up in a certain denomination. appreciate what I learned there. But there came a time in my life I realized that that denomination or that church wasn't going to get me to heaven. That church didn't die for me. That preacher or that priest or that person in that high position didn't die for me. Jesus died for me. And there came a time in my life at nine years old where Jesus passed by my life. And I still remember that day, even though I had been in church, although I had been in the Sunday school up through nine years old, although I had heard many messages preached and even had the preacher come and talk to me by request of my mom about the gospel, none of those things changed my life until one day the, I felt the Lord pass by my life. It was on that day that His hand rested upon me and I realized this wasn't about religion. This wasn't about a church service. This wasn't about having your name on a roll. It was about, are you born again? Are you saved by faith in Jesus Christ and Him alone? You see, if we put our faith in anything other than Jesus Christ, those things will fail us. Our faith is only as good as the object of our faith. It's not Christ plus something else. It's Christ alone. Christ alone. And as wonderful as Grace Fellowship is, Grace Fellowship can't get you to heaven. As much as you may or may not love me, I can't get you to heaven either. But I know someone who can. And He died for you. So God passed by her. He had an encounter with her. And it says he saw her. I wonder how many other people walked by and they didn't see her. They didn't care to see her. It's like the man in the story of the Good Samaritan who was beat up and thrown into the ditch after being robbed, beaten and left for dead. And people walked by and just looked in the ditch and kept on going. They didn't see the need. But there was a Good Samaritan. Jesus is the Good Samaritan. He saw us. He saw her. And He saw her in her struggle. God sees you in your struggle. God saw you struggling with your sin. With the hate and the pain and the hurt. With the addictions and the family problems. He saw you struggling just like He saw this baby struggling in her blood. And in the midst of that, God made a decision. He not only saw her, but He said something. He said to her in her blood, live. Others say die. I say live. Others say away with you. I say live. Jesus Christ came, John 10.10, 10, it says, the thief comes to steal, to kill, and destroy. But I have come that you may have life and life abundantly. And so he, he spoke life into her. He gave her hope. Christ gave me hope. If you know Him, He gave you hope of a changed life. Not to go back and live like you did. But a, a new life. There's nothing worth going back to. In that old life. And it says the Lord caused her to thrive like a plant in the field. It says she grew. She matured. She became very beautiful. Her feminine form began to blossom. And yet she was naked and bare. Now what does that mean? Well in the terminology it means that she had no covenant covering in her life. She had no covenant covering in her life. She was still on her own. And so many times 
in the midst of God's demonstration of mercy, God can come along and pick us up, just like in a service like this, many times people come down to the altar because they're looking for relief. They're not looking for repentance. I've seen that happen so many times. Praying a prayer, looking for relief. If God can help me, take this pain away. But they didn't want to change life. They didn't want a covenant relationship with Jesus. Matthew 7, 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father. That's what Jesus said. It's not enough just to say the right words. It's not enough just to say he's Lord when we don't treat him as Lord. Someone says if we don't obey him, is he really Lord at all? No matter what we call him. And so many are in that condition. She had no covering in her life. But God had shown mercy toward her, just like He has shown mercy toward me, and as He has shown to you. Many of you realize there have been times in your life that events happen and you shouldn't be here today. But it was the mercy of God that spared you in an automobile wreck or a, or a disease that came and threatened to take your life. Some tragedy or catastrophe that happened. But you're here today. It's the mercy of God. But there came a time, God said, it's time to make covenant. For you today, it may be that time. It may be that time for you to say, God, I'm not going to play the religious game anymore. I'm not just going to thank you for my food and my clothing and somehow just throw up a thank you every once in a while. But it's a time to get serious about my relationship with Jesus Christ. It says, when I passed by you again, I looked upon you. There comes a time, God says, are you ready for a commitment? Are you ready for a commitment? I wonder today, are you ready for a commitment to Jesus Christ? And it says, he's noticed it was the time of love. It was a time to make a commitment. Today is a time to make a commitment. There comes a point, you're either going to serve somebody else or you're going to serve Jesus. Who are you going to marry? Who are you going to love? Who are you going to follow? It was the time of love. Now, it says here that he spread his wing over her and covered her nakedness. Now, what does it mean, he spread his wing? Does that mean that God's some big chicken or bird? No. That is a phraseology that was used by the Jewish people. Many of them wore a prayer shawl or some kind of shawl. And, and, and that extension of that prayer shawl many times was referred to as the wings in prayer. And so when someone would pass that wing over someone, they were saying, I'm willing to be your covering. I'm willing to make you my own. It was like a proposal. Now we see some illustrations of this in the book of Ruth. Ruth was a Moabitess, but she had married an Israelite. The Israelite had died and her mother Naomi and her moved back to Israel. And there was a man there named Boaz who was a relative of the, this husband that had died and of Naomi. Ruth chapter 2 verse 12 says, The Lord repay your work and a full reward be given to you by the Lord God of Israel under whose wings you have come for refuge. Now the story of Ruth is, is that Naomi, Naomi said, You just stay in your country, you're a Moabitess. Just stay there and live your life. I'm going back to my home country. And she says, I will go where you go. I will stay where you stay. Your God will be my God. She made a decision to leave the gods of that land and come to the God of Israel. And she sought refuge under His covenant. She sought refuge under His wings. Later on, Boaz, who saw her and had favor, she, he knew who she was related to. And he would make special arrangements for her to glean in the field. And Naomi gave her counsel. 
It says, when he goes and he lays down there at the threshing floor, you go and when he goes to sleep, lay down at his feet. Here's the story in Ruth chapter 3, verse 7 through 9. After Boaz had eaten and drunk and his heart was cheerful, he went to lie down at the end of the heap of grain. And she came softly, uncovered his feet, and lay down. Now it happened at midnight that the man was startled. I guess I would be too. And he turned himself and there was a woman lying at his feet. And he said, who are you? And she answered, I am Ruth, your maidservant. Take your maidservant under your wing, for you are a close relative. In that day there, were, there was what was called leveret marriage. That meant when a man died in Israel and didn't have a child, a close relative would take her as wife and raise up a child on his behalf so that the inheritance could continue in that family. And when she was saying, take me under your wing, bring me into a betrothal, bring me into a relationship of marriage. And it says, the Lord spread his wing over Jerusalem. And the Lord swore an oath. He made a vow. And he made a covenant with her. That old covenant is what he's talking about. That covenant at Sinai. Remember, God brought Israel out of Egypt and he brought them to Sinai. Okay, Mount Sinai. And there he betrothed Israel as a nation to himself. And he gave them the betrothal agreement, which was the Ten Commandments. And His law, the covenant of marriage. See, God is a marriage covenant God. You're going to see that even more, I hope, as we go through this. This is a Cinderella story. And it says that Jerusalem became His. God says, you are mine. Isn't it wonderful to belong to somebody? To say, He's mine. Or she's mine. Out of everybody else, there is a sense of ownership in love and co covenant. You are mine, God said. What a love that God would say that we are His. 1 John chapter 3, verse 1 says, it talks about the love of God, that we should be called the children of God. What love is this? That God in our lost condition, would not only choose to have mercy on us and have grace upon us, but love us and take us as His own. Have you ever considered God's love for you? To take you from the, the trash pit and bring you to the palace? That's the kind of love. And He says that the Lord washed her in water. Well, that has New Testament connotation. Ephesians chapter 5 Verse 25 through 27, it talks about Christ being the husband of the church. And it says, Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word, that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. In other words, Jesus Christ is using the same imagery of taking someone that's an outcast and through the washing of the water where she has nothing of her own beauty, but He bestows His beauty and He bestows His cleansing upon her to make her into something she never could be in her own power. And isn't that true that God can take us and make us into something that we could never be in our own power? He's done work in me that I could have never done in my own self. He's not through with me. So if you see something in me that you don't like, keep praying for me. And I'll be praying for you that for the things in your life that don't look like Jesus yet. Because He's conforming us into His image and into His likeness. Amen? And the Bible says He anointed her with oil. In other words, He consecrated her with oil. They did that with kings and priests and prophets in those days. They would anoint them with oil and consecrate them to their calling. He anointed her with oil. He consecrated her unto Himself. She was an anointed bride. And it says the Lord clothed her 
Now listen. God is a king. He is a royal king. He has the beauty of his royalty. Can you imagine when we get to heaven and see the beauty of his royalty? I can't imagine anything that we could think here in this world, whether you go to Britain and see the crown jewels or wherever. I mean, those things have nothing compared to the glory of heaven. And it says that he clothed her in embroidered cloth. That was not peasant clothing. With sandals of badger skin, meaning that these were going to last. These were the fashionable shoes of the day. In fine linen and covered her with silk. And then not only did he clothe her, but he adorned her. In other words, he beautified her with bracelets on her wrist, a chain on her neck, a necklace, a jewel in her nose, earrings in her ears, a beautiful crown on her head. She was his princess. She was his queen. And she became exceedingly beautiful. And she succeeded to royalty. Oh, that's a Cinderella story right there. How this woman that was cast out at birth would rise to the palace and she would become the gaze of all. In fact, it says her fame went out among all the nations. Jerusalem was known in all the nations as the city of God, the chosen city of God, the royal city of God, the place of worship The temple of God. It says her beauty was perfect because of His splendor that He bestowed upon her. Now I think that's so important to remember here. That our beauty is not our own. You know when you get saved, your countenance changes if you really got saved. People who once seemed so ugly, and I'm talking about in their heart, suddenly become beautiful. Beautiful. Their outward package may not look all that awesome. Okay? But when the Jesus comes on the inside, He radiates. And there's a beauty that shines out. And she became beauty, beautiful and perfect because of His splendor. That betrothal of Jerusalem. And in that betrothal, we think of engagement, but engagement was not like it was in the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, they betrothed. In other words, they made a contract. And then there became, and they were legally married. And then there, they began to plan for the wedding day. God betrothed Jerusalem to Himself. In the same way, God has betrothed us to Himself. He's coming back for us. When Jesus said in John 14, He said, in my Father's house are many mansions. He's a royal king. If it were not so, I would let you know. But I go and prepare a place for you. That where I am, there you may be also. That's wedding language there. He's saying, I have betrothed you to myself. And I'm going and getting the palace ready for your arrival. And I'm going to come and I'm going to take you there. That where I am, there you may be also. Oh, I tell you, right now, we are living in between that betrothal and that return. Jesus is coming back. He's coming back as a bridegroom coming for His bride. Wow. But out of all of that, you would think Jerusalem would have been thankful and forever just completely submitted to His love. But no. Like so many... She resorted to harlotry. Verses 15 through 30 talks about her harlotry. She trusted in her own beauty. And she began to commit harlotry because of her fame. She thought she was somebody. Because she was so beautiful and people told her how wonderful she was. And it went to her head. It went to her heart. And she took the gifts that God had given to her and she involved them in idolatry. Which was unfaithfulness to the true worship of God. Not only that, but she committed adultery. Now her harlotry was different. Usually a harlot 
has someone pay for her services. But in this case, he says, your harlotry was different. You paid other people to service you. Yours is a life of harlotry. You sought out lovers. You chased after lovers. Can you imagine the heartbreak of God the Father? Could you imagine the heartbreak of Jesus? Even her children were given over to idolatry. She took children that belonged to God and involved them in false worship. And she returned to the religion of her father and mother from which she came. So many times we see people, they're in the church for a little while and then they go back to the world. God cleans them up and helps them get right. And then they go back and live like they used to. But even in that unfaithfulness, it reminds us of our own selves at times. Has there ever been a time in your life where you lived for Jesus? Said, I'll never go back. But somehow things went to your head. You began to look at the blessings of God and think, hey, this is all things I got. In my own strength and power, and I'm going to live my life for myself and my own enjoyment, I'm going to live life my way. Well, God gave her over to her lovers. But she found out these people didn't love her like He did. And the world doesn't love you like God does. And they abused her. And they stripped her. And they took what she had. She was a miserable person in a miserable condition. They destroyed her splendor, her beauty, and her blessings. That's the tragedy when we go away from God. We end up losing our way and everything that God blessed us with. It's a tragedy to see people walk away from God and see the outcome of that kind of choice. They're doing okay for a while. People go... Well, I stopped going to church and everything seems to be okay. Or I, I, I stopped doing what I know God told me to do and it's like everything's still okay and it's just a big deception. It's like, you know, getting up in the air in an airplane and turning the engine off and going, well, we haven't crashed. Everything still seems to, everything's okay. All right, yeah. We got this. And they don't, sense the spiritual decline they don't sense the approaching danger and the final crash it's heartbreaking as a pastor to see people come back to church and i'm glad they do but broken by sin who once were in the house of god and who served the lord and who loved him with all their heart but they come in broken and everything that they had was taken away from them because they refused to be faithful to God. But thank God for His redemption. Like the prodigal son who went away and came home. He didn't come home thinking he was to his father's house thinking I'm going to be, going, be restored as a son. He just said, I'm just looking for a job. I don't deserve to be your son. I don't deserve to have any of the blessings but... The servants in your house are better off than me. If you'll just hire me, I'll work for you like a servant for the rest of my life. But the Father's heart was a heart of redemption. And He restored the Son back to His place. Yes, He had lost His inheritance. And you lose a lot in your waywardness away from God. But God restored the relationship. He would put a, a ring on his finger, sandals on his feet, a robe on his back, kill the fatted calf because his son who was lost is now found. God remembered the original covenant he had with Jerusalem. But this time, he establishes an everlasting covenant. He said, I'm going to make another covenant. This is not a covenant that can be broken. This is an everlasting covenant. We call it in the New Testament, 
the new covenant. Hebrews chapter 13 verse 20 talks about the blood of the everlasting covenant. Jesus' blood. And He made an atonement for Jerusalem. And He brought her back to Himself. Isaiah chapter 62 verse 1 through 5 gives us a glimpse in the prophetic word. It says, for Zion's sake, Zion is another name for Jerusalem. For Zion's sake, I will not hold my peace. And for Jerusalem's sake, I will not rest until her righteousness goes forth as brightness and her salvation as a lamp that burns. The Gentiles shall see your righteousness and all the kings your glory. You shall be called by a new name. Everybody say a new name. Which the mouth of the Lord will name. You shall also be a crown of glory in the, ha- in the hand of the Lord and a royal diadem in the hand of your God. You shall no longer be termed forsaken, which means abandoned, nor shall your land any more be termed desolate or a wasteland. But you shall be called Hepzibah, which means my delight is in her, and your land Beulah, which means married. For the Lord delights in you, and your land shall be married. For as a young man marries a virgin, so shall your sons marry you, and as the bridegroom rejoices over the bride, so shall your God rejoice over you. And he says to her there in Ezekiel 16, verse 60 through 30, in his redemption, he said, you will be ashamed of the life you lived. And you will no longer open your mouth. In other words, your pride will be silenced. Your ego will be silenced. As you realize that you don't deserve any of this. You had your party. And you spent it all in unfaithful living, prodigal living. But I'm bringing you back and your mouth of pride will be shut. And you will realize that I am the Lord your God. I'm not just a husband, I'm also your God. Amen? And that redemption of that bride makes us remember the redemption of Christ that He made when He died on the cross for us. We didn't deserve it. Israel didn't deserve it. They had committed sin against God. This great covenant nation. They had gone and followed after idols and they had substituted religious works for a relationship with Him. And Jesus Christ came and inaugurated a new covenant. And He paid the sins under the old. And He brought them back to Himself. So we see the preparation of the bride, that new Jerusalem, the heavenly Jerusalem, Jerusalem above. By the way, before I get there, I'm reminded of a scripture where Jesus, before he was crucified, he looked out over Jerusalem and he he wept over Jerusalem. You remember that? He said, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how I have longed to gather you like chicks under my wing." In other words, to bring you into this covenant betrothal. But you would not. There's a lot of people who are just like that. They would not. They don't want to come under the Lordship of Jesus Christ. But in Matthew chapter 25, we see the preparation, the getting things ready. So then the kingdom of heaven shall be likened to ten virgins. By the way, when we talk about the bride, I am not the bride. You are not the bride. The bride is the church. The bride is the new new Jerusalem. We're going to see that. It is a people that God has for a bride. And by faith in Christ, we become a part of that bride. And in this situation, you see ten virgins, and only five of them made it into the bride. Now listen. Listen. The kingdom of heaven shall be likened to ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Now five of them were wise and five were foolish. Those who were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. But while the bridegroom was delayed, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight a cry was heard, Behold, the bridegroom is coming, go out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps, and the foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise answered, saying, No, lest there should not be enough for us and for you. But go, and rather, to those who sell, and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came. 
And those who were ready went in with him to the wedding, and the door was shut. Afterward, the other virgins came also, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Assuredly, I say to you, I do not know you. Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour in which the Son of Man is coming. That's a story of both blessing and tragedy. What was that that distinguished those who made it and those who didn't, those who became the bride and those who didn't? The five wives were waiting. The five wives kept their lamps full of oil. They weren't just living for a short time. So many people come to church for just a month, two months. They just live for God for a little while and then they're, they're burned out. But the wise are keeping their oil in their lamps. What does the oil represent? The Holy Spirit. The work of the Holy Spirit. A relationship with God. They're on fire. They're not going out because they're keeping the lamp burning and filled with oil. They're spending time with Jesus. They're longing for His coming. And they're looking out the window. Could today be the day? They're staying ready. Are you staying ready? Revelation chapter 19, verse 7 through 9. Let us be glad and rejoice. And give, glo give Him glory for the marriage of the Lamb. The Lamb is who? Who is the Lamb of God? Jesus is the Lamb. The marriage of the Lamb has come and His wife has made herself ready. And to her it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen and clean and bright, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saint. And then he said to me, Right, blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said, These are the true sayings of God. Wow. There's coming a wedding day, folks. The bride is making herself ready. This message today is to help stir you to be ready. God loves you. He cares for you. And there's a wedding day coming. Let's look at the bride. Revelation 21. We'll try to wrap this up. Revelation 21, verse 1 through 5. This is John, one of the apostles of Jesus Christ. Many times called John the Revelator because he recorded the words in the book of Revelation. It says, Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Also there was no more sea. Then I, saw, I, then I John, saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem. Didn't God say, I'll give you a new name? The new Jerusalem. Coming down out of heaven from God. Prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and He will dwell with them, and they shall be His people. God Himself will be with them and be their God. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. And there shall be no more death, no sorrow, no crying. There shall be no more pain. For the former things have passed away. Then He who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And He said, Write, for these words are true and faithful. Folks, there's a wedding day coming. We are even now preparing as a bride adorned for her husband as the worship team comes. What kind of invitation could be given today? I think the invitation God wants to give today is the invitation He gave at the end of the book of Revelation. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior today, I'm not talking about joining a church or becoming religious I'm talking about, do you know Jesus? Have you made Him your husband? Have you come into covenant? Have you allowed Him to stretch His wing of covenant over your life? If you've backslidden, gotten away from God, you've been like that unfaithful Jerusalem. Realize today that the ones that you're chasing after don't care about you anyway. Once the money runs out and the fun runs out, you're left behind. But there is a Redeemer in heaven who loves you and is willing to take you back and restore you and clean you up and give you a brand new beginning. Today, you can start a new life. Revelation chapter 22, verse 12 through 17, the invitation. Jesus said, And behold, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me to give to everyone according to his work. I am the Alpha and the Omega. That's the A to the Z. The beginning and the end. The first and the last. 
Blessed are those who do His commandments, that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter through the gates into the city. But outside are dogs and sorcerers, sexual immor immoral, murderers, idolaters, and whoever loves and practices a lie. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David, the bright and morning star. That's our king, folks. That's our king. And the Spirit, listen, this is the invitation. And the Spirit and the bride say, Come. And let him who hears say, Come. And let him who thirsts come. Whoever desires, let him take the water of life freely. Today, you can come and drink of this water. You can be satisfied. You can have eternal life if you'll come. Some may just need to come to the altar and get right with God. You're a Christian, but somehow you're not where you need to be. You can't say, Jesus, you're my only one. Because somebody else, something else, has gained your eye and your attention. Isn't it time to get back to Jesus? As we stand, will you come today? If you need to pray, I'll be glad to pray with you. If you need Jesus to become your Lord and Savior,